Coming up, Snowmageddon in KC. We grade the city's response. Plus, almost a year since a massive explosion rocks the Country Club Plaza. The final report into the JJ's Blast is finally released. What did we learn? Phantom lunches and thousands in unexplained expenses. The latest twist in the Grandview Mayor saga. And Union Station marks 100 years by bringing in its biggest exhibit ever. Those stories and more coming up. Hello everyone, I'm Nick Haynes and thanks for joining us again on the program that goes beyond the soundbite and takes you behind the headlines making news in Kansas City, dissecting the week's top stories from the investigation unit at 41 Action News, Ryan Kath from behind the microphone at News Radio 98.1 FM, KMBZ, Scott Parks. From behind another microphone across town, the host of Up to Date on KCUR FM, UMKC journalism professor and star columnist, Steve Kraske, and Kansas City Star political reporter, columnist, and blogger Dave Helling. Now, more than 10 inches of snow paralyzed the metro this week, and I mean paralyzed. Almost every school and local government building shut down. So did many area businesses, AMC announcing it was shutting down all of its theaters for the day. That was on Tuesday, including the mecca of the Kansas City shopping world, Oak Park Mall, closing its doors too. With Kansas City Mayor Sly James encouraging as many people to stay home as possible, some business owners complained he was overstepping his powers and making making it harder for them to staff their workplaces. Didn't mean to hurt you, but the bottom line is it doesn't matter what we do. There's going to be a percentage of people that are upset. So what we're always going to focus on is what we believe to be in the best interest of the majority of the people in this city. And in the best interest of the majority of the people in this city, it was best to stay home. Some of the callers to KMBZ this week also complaining that they were not getting staff coming in because the mayor saying that. Was he overstepping his bounds, Scott Parks? No, I don't think so. Um, I'm often critical of the mayor, but I don't think... To, to overstep his bounds would mean that he actually had the authority to have private business employees not go to work. And, of course, everyone knows the mayor doesn't have that authority. Uh, the mayor is within his purview to make recommendations to what he thinks is best for the city. And he has to act as in that capacity. Uh, business owners simply could have called their employees and said, regardless of what the mayor said, I'm the boss and you will be at work. I should also point out the mayor also this week pushing business owners to stagger start times uh, in different parts of the city to ease uh, traffic flow. Some would say he helped save a lot of uh, people's cars and injuries this week, Ryan. I was amazed driving around on Tuesday when the snow was falling, uh, going, going home during rush hour. I felt like I was the only car out there. So on the day of the snow, it actually worked very well. We didn't see any of that mayhem that was very fresh in everyone's minds from Atlanta. You know, from a national perspective, everyone saw these, you know, the gridlock on the freeways and how that was handled. And from a national perspective, Kansas City was lauded. I saw a tweet from Andrea Mitchell at NBC that said, uh, congratulations to Kansas City for a textbook example of how to handle a snow emergency. And we had Jim Cantori from the Weather Channel here doing picturesque live shots on the Kansas City Plaza with the snow plows going by, and he, of course, was very complimentary as well. You were cataloging the city's response also in a column today, uh, Dave Helling. How did the city do? Well, I, uh, the, the early reviews, anyway, suggest very well. Uh, they did very well, although obviously you get some complaints. They had about half as many complaints on Thursday than they did two days after the storm last February, which was another 10 or 11 inch storm. So that suggests the public is pretty sanguine about it. It is amazing how many non-essential employees there are in the Kansas City area who could all stay home <laughs> on the day of the storm. <laughs> Apparently we're all non-essential or most of the workforce is. But I think the point of my column, Nick, was uh, merits aside, as a political matter, <clears throat> Uh, mayors in Kansas City have a long history of sort of deferring to the Public Works Department or the city manager whose actual responsibility it is to clean the streets. And I think Sly James has finally realized that the public doesn't see it that way. They want to see their mayor taking charge, and he certainly did that. You know, it's not an accident that his news conferences were at 5 o'clock on the snow day because the TV stations can take them live. He gets uninterrupted access to the public. So as a political matter, I think the grades for Sly James are very high. He's also wearing a fire department uh, shirt in, in these news conferences. 
Now, he did that during the JJ's blast right afterwards there. That made sense perhaps then uh, because that was a fire-related emergency. Why in, in these particular cases is he doing that? Well, I don't know if the, there isn't a T-shirt, I guess, for a snow plow drivers. Maybe that's why he's doing what, what he's doing here. But I think he's showing a kinship in some ways with his first responders out there, Nick. It always strikes me that Kansas City doesn't do snow removal very well. We don't drive in it very, very well, and we certainly don't clear the streets very effectively inside Kansas City, Missouri. I have the distinct pleasure of living in northeast Kansas. I drive to work each day to UMKC on streets plowed down to the pavement on the Kansas aside, I hit State Line Road and it's like sledding down uh, the hill down towards uh, Ward Parkway to get to work every day. Kansas City streets are never clear and I thought the mayor did pretty well by handling it the way he did. But the city would always argue in Kansas City, Missouri, they have more miles to cover yes. and the type of resources that they have, uh, it is, you know, they have more miles than L.A. So it is a much more difficult proposition for them, Ryan Kath. The mayor's right. You're never going to make everyone happy after a major snowstorm. But um, as impressed as I was going home on Tuesday, the day the snow was falling with just how calm it was out there, coming in the next morning, getting over to the, the Missouri side and hitting some what I would consider to be some pretty main thoroughfares. Our station runs right along Oak Street, and it was some tough sledding right along Oak Street the next day. Uh, I think we have to be a little careful, Nick, on all of these events. To, to sort of uh, reach a judgment by anecdote. I mean, it's very hard to sort of grade somebody objectively on a situation like this because Ryan's experience, Steve's, Scott's, my, I live in Lenexa. Our streets were snow packed. They weren't cleared at all, at least in the first 24 hours. You know, it's, side, it's sort of a side street. Well, you know, it's tough for us to all reach judgment based on our own experience. But I do think the public seems less upset this time than maybe in years past. Certainly last February when there, you know, the interstates were a parking lot, that type of thing. You do get the sense that the public seems less upset about this response than others. Well, and, and in fairness, you know, we can criticize the snow removal in Kansas City, but I, I drove through two uh, semi-major Johnson County towns today, Mission and Shawnee, and both of them had residential streets that were still snowpacked that had right. not been cleared. And if I may just add one quick thing, if I can't be critical of anything that the mayor did this week, and I thought he was pretty effective most of the time, but I thought this staggered commute idea was poorly thought out. And if everybody had gone to work on, thir on uh, Wednesday, uh, it would not have worked. It, it, you need to divide the city north to south, not east to west, like the mayor and the city manager did. A year ago this month, a gas explosion tore apart the J.J.'s restaurant on the Country Club Plaza. Server Megan Kramer was killed in the blast that was felt almost a mile away. More than a dozen others were hurt in the explosion. This week, the long-awaited investigation report into what happened is finally released by the Missouri Public Service Commission. Among the findings, Missouri gas energy workers did not quickly monitor the level of natural gas inside the restaurant. In fact, it took 32 minutes from the time the first utility worker arrived at the scene before they went inside the restaurant to check for gas. There was no speedy evacuation, even after Missouri gas energy workers discovered high levels of natural gas in the building, 10 to 14 minutes before the blast. The Public Service Commission recommends six changes to the utility company's emergency procedures, including keeping fire department personnel on the scene and making sure their workers forcefully communicate when an evacuation may be needed. But were there any surprises in the report? Ryan. I was thinking about this yesterday. Uh, I've probably covered this topic more than any other topic I've covered in Kansas City. Our investigative team did an hour-long special on this last April that essentially was a minute-by-minute -minute look uh, at some of the decisions made leading up to that explosion. I didn't think there were very many surprises yesterday by the report. It essentially, I think, confirmed some of the things that had already been reported, some of the witness statements that there was no sense of urgency when people were coming around with their gas readers and saying, well, it's looking a little high, you know, maybe we should get out of here, but there wasn't that forceful, you need to get out right now. So I thought it confirmed a lot of the things that have been reported. The interesting thing going on in the background right now are all these lawsuits. And you better believe that's going to be used as leverage in some of these lawsuits now. But this also says that um, there may be court, court cases now relating to this. The Public Service Commission saying that this could be filed now in court. 
Right. And MGE was, I mean, we can, we can all dip into this, but MGE was, of course, forcefully denying that. But they know in the background now that that report is going to become a key piece of evidence in a lot of lawsuits. Think, yes. If you read the report, it, I think Ryan's right. There aren't a lot of surprises, although there are jaw-dropping moments. For example, the fire department shows up, stays for about, well, 10, 20 minutes, and then leaves just at the moment MGE arrives. And they still can't get straight whether or not MGE and the fire department even exchanged hellos, whether they even talked to each other. The report says that MGE says uh, uh, they didn't talk to the fire department. Fire department says, oh, no, 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 we talked with MGE when they responded. The other thing that's interesting about the report is the Public Service Commission sort of has MGE under its authority, and so it sort of blames MGE for at least the lion's share of the problem that night. OSHA has named Heartland, which is the company that was drilling the, uh, and, and hit the gas main. You get the sense when you read all of these things that everyone has a bit of the responsibility and that the point of the lawsuits will be to sort of distribute that. Mm -hmm. It was 10 percent the fire department's fault, 20 percent MG, or whatever that number turns out to be. Everyone did something that night they regret, at least in terms of the official response. To Steve, that very well said. You know, no big surprises in this report, Nick, but what a damning report. Keep in mind the gas levels inside JJ's that night as much as four times the allowable safety limit on what that gas level can be, and yet MGE workers still not hustling people out of that building, evacuation procedures not followed correctly. This is going to change the way these situations are handled in the future. Well, but the, the first three letters of news are new, and there was nothing new in this report. We all knew that Heartland had ruptured the line. We knew that there was a, a smell of gas, a strong smell of gas inside JJ's restaurant. We knew the fire department showed up and left. We knew MGE was not forceful in getting people out of that restaurant. I, I couldn't find nothing new in this report that would make it news. The only new items I found were, it's according to who you talked to, it somewhat exonerated Heartland Midwest by saying they probably wouldn't have struck the gas line if the lines had been properly marked. So that was a little bit of a new element there. Also, the new element, like Dave mentioned, that jumped out at me was whether or not the fire department and MGE ever talked, period, on the scene. I mean, right. we knew the fire department was only there for one or two minutes after that MGE first responder was there, but now this report calls into question whether the fire department was already out of there by the time uh, the first and, MGE. And, and wouldn't you agree, Ryan, someone is lying. Now, either the fire department lies when it says that it talked with MGE, uh, or, or MGE is not telling the truth in, in, in terms of what that interchange was, and I think that's critical going forward. The fire department has changed its procedures. But, but this was the last report, though, the final report. More or less, I, you know, I, and I, we have surveillance video of the fire department where you can see them leaving the area. And we went back again yesterday and looked just to see if you could see in, any interaction, and you couldn't. But, you know, like Dave mentioned, to its credit, the fire department very quickly changed some of its policies in the wake of this. Also interesting to me was just how strongly MGE is defending itself here. And you wonder if that's just lawsuit mitigation efforts, Nick, or whether they really have a point here. You know, they're saying that they followed all kinds of procedures here correctly. Uh, you know, they they couldn't force people out of the building. Their workers don't have that kind of authority. But holy smokes, what a, again, what a damning report. He resigned last month totally unexpectedly, and since then there have been questions of an FBI probe into the former mayor of Grandview, Steve Dennis, and a non-profit he created. This week, 41 Action News catalogs thousands of dollars of questionable purchases, including dozens of phantom lunches with top local elected leaders. Dennis charged dozens of meals to taxpayers, sometimes saying he dined with local politicians like Kansas City Council members Jan Markison and John Sharp and Jackson County Executive Mike Sanders. But those elected leaders tell us they have no record or recollection those meals ever happened. Another stunning development for neighbors who have known Dennis for years. He always seemed to be an honest person to me, so to hear that is very surprising. The voice of Ryan, uh, Ryan Kath, an excerpt from a much more extensive report that ran this week on 41 Action News. Were you able to reach the former mayor? The mayor has been off the grid since this <laughs> happened. I mean, it is amazing. I, I, the neighbor that I talked to right there, his next door neighbor of, of six years, said he's seen him once or twice in the past four weeks. So they have not been staying at that house. They've been staying somewhere else. The mayor has not responded to any of my requests for comment, any of the Kansas City Star's requests for comment. I mean, he has been MIA. Has there been any response from the mayor since he left office, period? 
Not really, other than just a very cryptic statement that this was a very difficult decision uh, when he, you know, before he resigned. But that was about all anybody got. And that's what's been very tough for people in Grandview to try to grasp this, because by all accounts, he was a very energetic, popular mayor. And talking to folks at City Hall, you know, this is supposed to be kind of a part-time gig, pays $16,000 a year. They said he was there around the clock. But it seems like oh, even with these questionable lunches that didn't have receipts attached to them and some of these elected officials saying, well, I, I didn't even know, I, I didn't even have lunch with him. And we have some receipts here for the Apple Store and Target and you, Goldman's that you have in your longer report. But it seems um, a lot to say that this is now going to be part of an FBI probe. These seem still to be very trivial matters, don't they? On its own, yes, but they might point to larger issues. And just to give a little bit of background here, uh, we know the FBI is looking into this now defunct nonprofit and possibly some of the fundraising that went on with that. We know the FBI was looking at his campaign contributions um, by virtue of an FBI agent who was nice enough to leave behind a copy of his business card with the campaign report file. That was a nice little uh, nugget he left behind. So. I just started looking at his expense reports just to see if there was anything else. And honestly, John Sharp, the Kansas City Councilman, popped up five times. And I called him just to see how well he knew Steve Dennis, to see if he had any insight and if he'd talked to Steve Dennis since this happened. And, I, and John Sharp said, well, I really, I really don't know him that well at all. I can maybe think of once or twice that I bumped into him. And I said, well, according to his expense reports, you, you've gone to lunch with him five times and there was just crickets chirping on the other end of the line. And that's what led to the rest of the report. Still no resolution on this issue, Steve? Not at all. And still a big question about exactly what the FBI is looking into here. And, and, and you're right. You know, the FBI wouldn't necessarily look at these expense account lunches, all that kind of thing. But, Ryan, uh, very good point. This obviously could point, what very well could point to bigger issues down the road. Exactly what those are, we don't know. But uh, it, make, it makes you wonder. I think it's important to point out that the aldermen in Grandview and some of the other city officials have maintained that this is a personal matter from the former mayor. The city is completely separate from this. However, the report you just saw, taxpayer money, and that calls into question whether there was a misuse of taxpayer money on some of those purchases. Coming up next, guess who's coming to town? When he was a young man, he never thought it seemed Okay, not Steve Martin, but the Boy King himself, Union Station, marking its 100th anniversary this year. It's celebrating by bringing to Kansas City its biggest exhibit ever. Get ready for Tutankhamun, Kansas City, launching a new North American exhibition featuring more than a thousand artifacts from the world of King Tut. 100 years of Union Station. Is this an effective way of celebrating the occasion, Scott Parks? You're a history buff. Not that far back. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess. I mean, it, it doesn't light any fires in my pants, but, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe if I got... a topic for a different... Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. If I got that some... suggests his pants are wet, and we don't want to go there. <laughs> okay, but... Jeez, <laughs> Dave. But, at all. But, uh... Um, <laughs> But I do think that Union Station over time, uh, Nick, has learned uh, that it needs to refresh its attractions for people to go back on more than just one or two occasions. Particularly, we, we've talked about this for a long time, Science City, which was supposed to be the main attraction, has not really turned out to be that. And I think even the people who work down there would agree. And so they're trying to do a good job of cycling new exhibits through. Th this will be a good one. You know, we went down to the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibition. Very interesting stuff. Union Station probably is the best place for that kind of thing. Uh, and hopefully it'll put enough fannies in the seats, so to speak, to, to, to put some money into the pockets of the people who run the uh, station. The discovery of King Tut exhibit coming April 4th to Union Station. I mean, this is more than a 1,000 um, items, replicas, actually, which some people are concerned about. They are only replicas, but I'm, I'm sure it is very difficult, as they say today, because of the turmoil in Egypt, to get those exhibits actually today out of Egypt, Steve Kransky. Yeah, they can't get the actual, the real, genuine articles out of Egypt into this exhibit. And I think it will be maybe an issue with some folks, but still, there's a track record here of Union Station doing a great job with these uh, exhibits, and this is going to be, uh, you know, 20,000 square feet 
all kinds of uh, very elaborate stuff. I think there'll be a little bit of buzz in town about this thing. You know, it's amazing when it's 100 years of Union Station, you don't hear the negativity the same way as you once did all. about what's happening there. Are, are they on a sound financial footing now? Very much so compared to where they used to be, Nick. It's become an office park in a sense. Uh, <laughs> the Kansas City Chamber of Commerce, so many other folks uh, uh, locked in there now. The Kansas City Election Board uh, housed at Union Station. Very different than what it used to be. Coming up next, why was the nation's health secretary, Kathleen Sebelius, in town this week? And why was she appearing with Kansas City Mayor Sly James? President Obama called for 2014 to be a year of action. And we want to make sure that in the next eight weeks, the action is reaching out to people who may not know that affordable, available health care is um, underway and give them an opportunity to make a good decision for themselves and their families. Ensuring the uninsured is the right thing to do. It's a moral imperative. Many of our citizens are one health care event away from total bankruptcy and financial ruin. So what does Sly James have to do with the Affordable Care Act, Dave Helling? Well, I think it's just part of the outreach, which frankly has been la lacking in our area to some degree in terms of reaching populations who could benefit from the coverage under the Affordable Care Act and particularly getting younger people to sign up. And so I think he's just part of that, that effort. <coughs> Missouri and Kansas have been far behind other states in sort of trying to make people understand what their options are under the under the uh, Obamacare law, in part because, of course, Missouri and Kansas legislators are not very fond of it. So I think, um, you know, there's some effort to sort of uh, raise the profile of this issue for some people, and that's why the secretary and the mayor got together. There's a nationwide push now underway, not just in Kansas City, but across the country to get people enrolled. The secretary had a secondary a motivation for being here, too, Nick. She wanted to push one more time lawmakers in Kansas and Missouri to expand their Medicaid programs. The chances of that happening in Kansas, uh, the governor, uh, Sebelius' former state, that's not going to happen. But in Missouri, you do sense maybe a little crack in that foundation. Republicans may be softening a little bit to the idea of, of, of expanding Medicaid. Sebelius points out millions of dollars a day being passed up by both states for not expanding their Medicaid uh, enrollments. Could voters in Kansas City be deciding light rail and streetcar expansion this year? The Missouri Supreme Court this week declared that Maverick transit activist Clay Chastain's light rail initiative that was blocked by the city from appearing on the ballot back in 2011 is constitutional. The state's high court found that a Jackson County District Court aired when it found that Chastain's light rail plan violated the Missouri Constitution. So what happens now? Will we be voting on both of these items, Dave Helling? It's possible. It's going back to court, the local court. The court could order it on the ballot. That seems to be the implication, the Chastain plan, seems to be the implication of the Supreme Court decision. It's possible we might have votes on two different transit systems sometimes later this year. We'll see. So Clay Chastain coming back, Scott Parks. You know, he reminds me of the light rail version <laughs> of Justin Bieber. He just that's a positive he, thing. He, no, oh, okay, all he right. He just <laughs> doesn't know when enough is enough. And and I think Kansas City, and I think I can speak for the city at large, uh, we're chastained out. Yeah, I, I don't okay. disagree with that. But can I just say briefly, the city is not blameless in this situation either, Nick. Sure. They, they 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 always try to avoid what he does, to not put it on the ballot. Just put it on the ballot. Let people vote, Steve. Yeah. And it gets to a point that Dave has been on the show many times, Nick, which is getting something on the ballot in this town is very easy to do. 3,500 signatures. Right. You can get 3,500 people to sign up to get rid of the police department and reinstall Batman and Robin uh, as, as burning the police department in this town. It's, it's too easy. Okay. Over the weekend, the nation was transfixed by the Super Bowl. And believe it or not, Kansas City gets the best TV ratings of any city in the country for the mega sporting event. And Chiefs own a clock hunt, celebrating the success of the first open-air stadium event tells the Wall Street Journal it's time to give Kansas City a shot to host a Super Bowl. Clearly uh, having a, an open-air stadium uh, would, would make it a challenge, but uh, we all said when New York got the game that they're really going to uh, lay the foundation for what happens next. And if there is an opportunity to bid on a Super Bowl, I would expect that Kansas City would be in that mix. Wishful thinking, or is that now a possibility, Scott Parks? I guess anything's possible. I would I would argue that that is extremely wishful thinking. They got lucky with the weather in New York. Can you imagine if the Super Bowl was held in Kansas City today? Yes. It would be it would be the worst. <laughs> 
public relations move for Kansas City ever. Ryan. I cheated a bit on this one. I enlisted the uh, the help of the 41 Action News weather team. I was just curious. And the entire sports yeah, team. If, if okay. we had had the Super Bowl in Kansas City the last five years, what would that day have been like? And overall, we actually would have been okay because, it, you know, we keep thinking about these huge snowstorms we've had in February. But last year, sunny high of 46. 2012, snow the night before, but sunny high of 46. 2011, cloudy with flurries, high of 37. 2010, snow increased during the day, one to two inches of snow. And then 2009, mostly sunny with a high of 47. So overall, we would have been pretty well off, but a huge roll of the dice. Terrific research. It also takes a huge number, <laughs> a huge number of hotel rooms. Well, that's my point I was going to make was uh, we don't, I don't think we have as many hotel rooms as we need for that event, nor do we really potentially have enough for the Republican National Convention. And I think one of the yes. things that's going to happen, if Kansas City loses that bid and loses the idea of a Super Bowl, someone named Mayor Sly James is going to stand up and say, we need a convention hotel <laughs> and, so we can um, land And Scott these Parks, of because of his remarks on the show, cost us a halftime show with Justin Bieber. Final <laughs> remarks from you, Steve? <laughs> yeah, Possibility? I, I, I think it's a okay. sketch without that downtown convention. All righty. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers, keeping you up to date, 11 to noon, weekday mornings on KCURFM, Steve Kraske, and the Sherlock Holmes of 41 Action News investigative <laughs> reporter, Ryan Kath. He is 50% of Dana and Parks, heard 2 to 6 weeks. Weekdays on News Radio 981 KMBZ, Scott Parks, and rolling up his sleeves every day to tackle all sorts of tough public policy issues on both sides of state line for the Kansas City Star, Dave Helling. And I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.